Osiris. Welcome to Across the Margin, the podcast, where we take you beyond the margin, behind the scenes of the online magazine, and deeper into the stories. I'm your host, Michael Shields, and today I am proud to present what I believe is an extremely informative and important episode, one that delves into a topic we have explored on this podcast before, and one we will continue to talk about until more people are talking about it, and we as a community, a country, and a world act and aggressively begin to address the problem, and that it topic is the real and ever-present threat of climate change. The fact of the matter is, climate change is real, and we are in the midst of an extremely serious threat to all life on this planet. And what is remarkable is not only that the government of the United States is complicit in ignoring the astonishingly precise science and research at hand, and fails to openly recognize that infinite economic growth on a planet with finite resources is infeasible. But the lack of media coverage regarding climate change is flat out irresponsible. And that idea, the media's failings in regard to climate change, will be the focus of this episode today, as I am lucky enough to feature an interview I conducted with Dr. Genevieve Gunther, who is the founder and director of an incredible nonprofit organization called End Climate Silence. EndClimateSilence.org is a volunteer organization dedicated to helping the media link stories about climate change impacts to climate change itself. Mobilizing through digital activism, they are an organization motivated by the awareness that climate change possesses a grave danger to humanity and that an immediate transition from fossil fuels to safe energy is necessary in order to preserve a planet that supports civilization. They recognize that climate change has begun to hurt people, and it's the media's job to report on that fact. So in this episode, Dr. Gunther and I dive deeply into the importance and fallout surrounding the recent UN Special Report on Global Warming, which was entirely eye-opening. We we discuss the abject failure of the media in correctly reporting about climate change. We talk some about the wildfires ravaging California and how they relate to climate change. Uh, We discussed the midterm elections and and how that might affect policy and and a whole lot more. It's it's truly um, uh, one of the most urgent and timely episodes uh, we've had here uh, at Across the Margin, the podcast. But before we dive in, just a reminder that Across the Margin, the podcast is a proud member of the Osiris Network. Osiris connects you with podcasts, videos, and live experiences about the artists and topics you love. Visit OsirisPod.com, and while there, checking out the eclectic mix of informative and exciting podcasts they have to offer, sign up for the newsletter so you don't miss any new interviews, events, or podcasts. That is OsirisPod.com. Check it out, and um, so let's get into it. The science is clear. We need immediate action on climate change. And the work that Dr. Gunther is doing to spread the word about the media's shortcomings in regard to climate change is absolutely game-changing. So uh, I think you will find this conversation informative, eye-opening, and wholly enjoyable. So here is my interview with Dr. Genevieve Gunther. Genevieve, uh, thank you so much for being here. Well, really thank you for asking me. It. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love what you uh, do. Do I love your organization, which I want to learn more about. And, uh, um, you know, I know you've been real busy since this UN climate report uh, mm-hmm. came out. And so that's another reason I'm so thankful that you're making the time. But uh, so that thing was pretty daunting, a little, little bit alarming, huh? It was terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So what was it telling us? What it's telling us is that we have to have our 
overall greenhouse gas emissions in 12 years Mm -hmm. and draw them down entirely to zero, net zero, in 30 if we're going to have any chance at halting and warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, Even even with that, it seems like um, it's not – it's not going to be that much easier to halt warming at two degrees Celsius mm-hmm. either. So right now, of course, we're on an emissions trajectory that's going to get us to 3.5 or 4 degrees Celsius by the end. Which is absolutely end. devastating. Yeah, which yeah. is basically um, nearly the difference between the last ice age and the climate that we have now. Oh, so wow. if you can imagine that kind of transformation on top of what we have now mm-hmm. and how it's going to change the ecology and the habitability of the planet, then, you know... I don't know mm-hmm. about you, but my heart starts to race yeah, a little no. bit. <laughs> that, just, that just made me uh, take a deep, deep breath. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. Um, yeah, you m- mentioned the amount of time. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's almost being taken um, – I'm seeing some people kind of read it wrong, meaning that we have that time period, 12 years to kind of get a plan in order. But, exactly. But uh, we have zero time to to figure this out and get a plan in order. That's about – that's the time period till we get the emissions down, down right? Exactly. Okay. I even, yeah, I even saw, you know, with the protests in Pelosi's office that um, uh, Octavia Cortez, she was a little, she was still talking about a plan. Right, exactly. And that idea, but like it's more code red than that, right? No, it's absolutely more code red than that. And in fact, um, I was reading an article that Chris Hayes wrote about the fossil fuel industry in 2010. Mm-hmm. And I realized that actually what the IPCC said a few weeks ago isn't really new. Okay. They've been given a, giving us this timeline for quite some years now. It's been the same timeline? It's pretty it's much been, on, on target? Yeah, well, it's been the same yeah. timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, but they haven't actually isolated. Um, they haven't isolated it and highlighted it mm-hmm. in the way that they did with this special report. Yeah. Um, and, of course, also the time hasn't been quite as short before. Sure. So I think people are finally starting to realize that um, we can't procrastinate anymore. Yeah. It's always um, seemed like something kind of far out in the distance when totally. it's discussed. And, 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 you know, now we're seeing things happening in, in real time. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, the fires in California yeah. that have just made um, – I don't know, 15,000 families homeless yeah. in less than 24 hours. Yeah, 56 people have died, 297 people are missing right now. Yeah, yeah. and this is just the very, very beginning of what we're going to see if yeah. we don't stop burning fossil fuels and mm-hmm. um, start treating our land and our ecosystems differently. Yeah, absolutely. That one, that one's kind of hitting close to home. You know, it's, totally. it's, 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 it's right here right now. And, That's right. Uh, I think uh, one thing people aren't really discussing enough in the media is, is how much this does relate to climate change. I mean... You know, I, I know our president was talking about forest management and stuff, mm-hmm. but this is this has to do, I believe, with the amount of precipitation that California has gotten, uh, especially important fall precipitation. That's right. Which, yeah, that's is that right. The case? Yep, that's absolutely the case. I mean, granted, I'm not a climate scientist, sure. but I do try to keep up on the latest research, yep. and it seems like the uh, rainy season, um, from what I understand, is starting much later in the year. Yeah. And when California does get rain, it gets it in these huge precipitation bursts, Mm -hmm. which um, causes all this like new growth, Mm -hmm. which then dries out at the next drought, which happens, you know, essentially every year. So there's all of this kindling, Mm -hmm. super, super dry. um, And essentially it's the condition for the worst possible wildfire that you can imagine, which is yeah. why essentially there is no more rainy season and fire season in California. It's just fire season all year yeah, long. Yeah, it's, yeah. So. It's, it's not a season. It's just that's a right. thing. It's just so, a thing it's, so that initial drought condition and the heat both are caused by climate change Absolutely. Um, and the rise of one degree Celsius warming just uh, globally. It's Yeah, the, um, you know, they need that fire and uh, season ending moisture. And I guess it was down 20 to 30 percent. And exactly. all objective indicators of vegetation dryness and potential for fire intensity were at record high levels. That's right. All climate change. It's all climate change. Yeah. So and this is the thing, though, you, you know, it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, there have been wildfires in California before. Mm-hmm. Um, there has been rain. There yeah. have been hurricanes. There have been all of these events in um our climate system and humans have always been subject to these kinds of things, but never at the scale and the magnitude and the relentlessness Mm -hmm. that climate change is going to cause these events to come, you know? And of course, it's not just these sort of like headline grabbing catastrophes like wildfire or hurricanes or floods. It's also the fact that, you know, our entire planetary ecology is going to change. So, you know, we grow so much corn in the Midwest 
it seems like we won't be able to do that anymore. Yeah. You know, it's really a matter of people are just not going to have enough to eat and drink. Quite mm. aside from all these, you yeah, know, terrible storms, yeah, calamities and disasters. Um, so. We really need to stop burning fossil fuels immediately. <laughs> immediately to me, it seems now. like totally worth it. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> like, it's, I mean, it does. It seems like a no-brainer. And you would think that people would be talking about it more, talking about it in the mm-hmm. right way. And that's what you do with um, End Climate Silence. Can you tell us a little bit about this organization that you uh, found and run? Yeah. So um, it's funny because there's a sort of long backstory. So cut me off at any point. No, go, go. I want to hear it. <laughs> I love it. I love what you do here. So I'm trained as an academic. Mm-hmm. I'm actually um, a Shakespearean. My degree is in Renaissance literature. Oh, wow. Cool. So um, I became kind of really concerned about climate change after I had a child. And I started thinking about, you know, his life and what would happen to the planet Mm -hmm. after I died. So that's what started it all. And I didn't quite know how I was going to work on it. Um, But I became completely galvanized and radicalized when the New York Times hired Brett Stevens. Mm -hmm. He is an opinion columnist for Mm -hmm. them Mm -hmm. who has a record of having the most egregious um, statements uh, well, he has a record of, of, of circulating the most egregious Republican climate denial. Yeah. And, of yeah. course, um, I just was so shocked that this institution, which I assumed was sort of, you know, in the reality-based community, mm-hmm. could hire someone who had denied climate science mm-hmm. and argued that there was really no reason for us to ever stop burning fossil fuels. No, it's extremely dangerous. Mm-hmm. It's actually genocidal. Yeah. So yeah. I was so appealed that I actually started a petition to try mm-hmm. to get Brett Stevens yes. unhired. Nice. Wow. Um, this is a fascinating genesis. And to, to it started yeah. like it started getting some play because this was just before the March for Science. Mm-hmm. So the March for Science Facebook page that had 800,000 members circulated it, and it got a lot of signatures. And then the coordinator or the campaigner, rather, excuse me, mm-hmm. for Change.org called me up and said, okay, your petition is starting to get some play. I'm going to coach you on how to market it, yes. essentially. And she got me on Twitter. Yep. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what Twitter was because, of course, <laughs> well, I'm like so a good at it now. You're so good at it now. Well, yeah. I guess, but um, just it's because it's like a really – it's a community of smart people who complain a lot yep. and think the world is going to hell and who are funny. So <laughs> yeah, it's sort exactly. of like, you know, I like these people. These you just people. nailed down what Twitter is so perfectly. That was amazing. <laughs> that said, yeah. um, so I went on Twitter to promote this petition. Mm-hmm. But, be, you know, because of that, I started following climate scientists and I followed – um, science and environmental journalists. Mm-hmm. And I sort of um, became connected to this community of people who think and study and write about climate change mm-hmm. for a living. Um, and of course, um, Twitter is the place where media people talk to each other. Yeah. And I just started to notice slowly that the sort of general media folk weren't really talking about what the scientists were talking mm-hmm, about. Mm-hmm. And the journalists were writing these kind of very detailed, very well-written deep dives into what the scientists were talking about, but they weren't getting picked up and circulated by the mm-hmm, general media. Mm-hmm. And it just struck me that there was this kind of ghettoization of climate change into the sort of science section or the environment section. And it was kind of just rattling around in my head. And then there was this one day when I was in the car, which is an electric vehicle. (laughs) (laughs) Must be noted. Must be noted. And I was listening to NPR for about three hours. And there were three different stories which were clearly about the catastrophes of climate change, drought in the West, um, the floods in Japan Mm -hmm. this past summer, Mm -hmm. the heat waves, various other things. Nobody mentioned climate change at all. Yeah, the words didn't even come up when they were discussing it. It didn't even come up, not even Mm -hmm. once. Mm -hmm. So – I got home and I had lunch and I just wrote a little thread, which is what I often do when I'm eating lunch. (laughs) And it resonated. It got circulated a lot. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think almost 3,000 people retweeted it. Mm -hmm. Um, People started talking about it, even if they weren't retweeting it. Chris Hayes weighed weighed in. Um, And in a conversation that Chris Hayes was having with another journalist, he said something to the effect of, well, we can't really do these stories about climate change because people turn off the television. That's my next – I was going to go steer us towards why – you know, why does the media not want to cover climate change? Is it because people just are not interested? It's a ratings bummer. Okay. But I jumped in at that moment and I said, well, you don't actually have to do discrete stories about climate change. 
You just have to mention climate change in the stories about the, their effects that you're already reporting. Mm-hmm. You know, and Chris Hayes doesn't know me from, you know, Eve. Yeah. But he actually replied and he said, you know what? You're right. That's yeah. what we can do. And I had this aha moment that I realized that that was what was missing. Mm-hmm. People think of climate change as a scientific topic. Yeah. They think of the solutions as sort of technical solutions. There are these kinds of like um, almost nerdy topics that you can sort of put to the side and that you don't have to think about if you're interested in breaking news or yeah. politics mm-hmm. or – money or any of these things that really govern most of the media conversation. But I realized that if you actually look at the front page or you look at stories in the national section or the world section, Mm -hmm. there are stories about climate change effects every single day and very often more than one. And most of them don't even mention the the words Mm -hmm. climate change. So people are sort of, you know, reading the news, experiencing the world through this sort of mediation of the media, Mm -hmm. quite literally, not realizing that climate change is bearing down on us right now yeah. and getting increasingly more deadly and frightening with every passing month because yeah. the media just doesn't mention it. Mm-hmm. And I think there are many reasons for this. But anyway, I realized that because the thread on Twitter had had some success yeah. and because I had had this sort of like positive reaction from Chris Hayes mm-hmm. and because I just sort of saw this thing that I felt like other people – Agreed with, but hadn't necessarily seen. I was like, okay, this is this is my role as an activist in this movement. Mm-hmm. I can actually start poking people um, to try to change their practice a little bit and just mention climate change in one or two sentences in the stories about climate change effects that they're already reporting. Anyway, yeah. that's the whole. Long no, so saga. that's the idea of and co- climate silence is to. Um, I guess chastise could be a word, uh, yeah. different media uh, firms and, and, and outlets for not talking about climate change when they might even be talking about climate change. And also I like the idea of praising when they do. Yeah, totally. I mean, you, you know, these people need a <laughs> pat on the back when they're finally finally doing what they should. Um, so that's the idea. That is, that's it. That's great. You know, and that's I can so do important. it because I'm not really a journalist, yeah. right? I don't. Kind my of outside paycheck, the fray a little exactly, bit. Exactly. Yeah. My paycheck is not relied – like I am not financially reliant on getting people to offer me columns mm-hmm. or pick yep. up my writing in yeah. any way. Um, so – Yeah, there's power in that for sure. You know, Freedom. it's OK if I if I annoy people. <laughs> we need <laughs> like, you. We need you to annoy people. That's great. And, you know, it's like I don't – uh, it's okay. I yeah. don't mind annoying people yeah. if it, you know, if it moves if it the means, needle a I little mean, bit. Well, no, you're doing the work that needs to be done. If it, no, if it takes, nice. if it takes annoying people, I saw you say that 78 percent of people don't even hear about climate change even once a week in their media diets. What? The, <laughs> that's. I mean, that's. <laughs> I'm just, shaking my head because it's slowly like yeah, exploding it's over so, here. So uh, disheartening, just just to hear that. It's mind boggling. Yeah, it's. I don't know. It's it's, but yeah. So it's it's more need for why this uh, needs needs to be out there, and just why you know the work you're doing so so important. Did you um, do you find any hope in any, any of the recent elections? I know. Um, I mean, I, I is it possible now that uh, we have a House Science Committee that, for the first time in a decade, could be led by someone who believes in climate science? Well, there's some definite positive improvements. Yeah. Um, the fact that the House committee is going to be led by someone with scientific background mm-hmm. um, and an African American woman is that is, uh, Edie Bernice Johnson? Yeah, 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 yeah. is mm-hmm. is awesome. Yeah, she's first African American and first female committee member in, in two thousand. Yeah, so this yeah. is this is this is an extremely fantastic development. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like Nancy Pelosi's idea to. Um, reinstate the special committee on climate change. I personally yeah. think that the Democrats need to have hearings, two hearings a week, yep. at least, not yeah. only to sort of um, keep this in the media, mm-hmm. not only to keep the testimony in the public record, but also to start hashing out what a real plan might look like if the Democrats can really take the White House and the Senate and the House in 2020 yeah. so that we can actually – just hit the ground running. Hit kind the of. ground yeah, running no and have a plan that is commensurate with mm-hmm. what the IPCC is telling yeah. us we need to do in order to, to save the lives needs. of like literally hundreds of millions, if not mm-hmm. billions of people. Yeah. Um, it's that important. <laughs> yeah. So those are really good um, developments. I think also that Sean Caston uh, won his uh, race against a climate denying Republican mm-hmm. and he won. What, where was that? 
I'm sorry. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know either. You, you had me. And I, I'm pretty up on those things as well. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but either way, that happened, and he took it from uh, and I remember, Private Denier. Yeah. yeah, and I remember reading that he ran, I think it was Emily Atkin in the New Republic who wrote an article about him, and he ran specifically on a climate platform. Yeah. Um, oh, he, wow. Yes. People don't do that. I mean, people moderators aren't even asking the questions. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this is also a positive thing. And he, mm -hmm. um, I guess he ran a renewable energy company before he went into politics. So he was able to come at it from a kind of businessman's perspective, mm. which was, I think, very astute yeah. on his part. But I think that um, that is also a really positive development. Yeah. Um, there was some things that were very disheartening. I thought, you know, Florida was definitely disheartening. I yeah. mean, they're feeling... Uh, the effects, you know, seeing it firsthand. I had um, uh, John Morales on the show once, mm. and he uh, he's a meteorologist down in Miami, and he was just telling me everything that was happening daily that yeah. he definitely attributes to climate change yeah. and, you know, the severe flooding and everything like that. You know, you'd think them being on the front lines, they'd maybe be making better decisions for their own interests. And I saw that only two of seven climate-related measures on ballots across the country mm -hmm. went in the planet's favor, which right. that kind of... Kind of sucks, but um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, but, but yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the money that's being put in. I think yeah. I saw, was it a hundred million or something that yeah. fossil fuel companies put into these uh, election? I know there was thirty million in Washington to defeat uh, Initiative One, one um, 1631, right? Exactly, uh, which would establish the first ever carbon fee. I do want to talk about carbon in a second, but sure. uh, but um, so that money goes in. I mean. The, I'm, I'm always wondering how that money uh, just correlates to votes. I mean, they're putting mm -hmm. it into ads, negative ads, saying we're, you know, I don't know. It's just. Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, even if you as a climate acti activist or an advocate or a politician who's trying to pass climate policy, even if you get the messaging just right, mm -hmm. there's no way that you're going to achieve the kind of coverage the kind of scope, yeah. the kind of relentless drum beating yeah. that the oil and gas industries are going to be able to buy mm -hmm. with their just vast amounts of cash. Yeah. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the playing field is kind of stacked against – or it, it, the playing field is stacked in the fossil fuel industry's favor just because yeah. they're so obscenely rich mm -hmm. and because they just don't care that they're killing people. So yeah. – they will do whatever they can to quell any kind of threat to their business model. Yeah. Um, so that is disheartening mm -hmm. for sure. Um, that said, I also think that um, I also think that money isn't everything. Okay. Hillary Clinton outspent Donald Trump two to one. Yeah. And you know, granted there was Russian interference. Granted there was yeah, gerrymandering but, and mm -hmm. voting suppression. Mm -hmm. um, but she, it still you know, did she, not equal the outcome. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, she didn't get twice as many votes as Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there is a way in which um, what money is buying you is the circulation of your language in mm. public discourse, mm. and um, that can be countered. I am hoping by a smarter, or I shouldn't say smarter, but a sort of updated messaging strategy on the part of people yeah. who are trying to implement climate policy. Making the message um, more powerful, um, yeah. you know, might not get as uh, as widespread or, or more precise. I right. Say. Yeah. But that said, I think mm -hmm. that that is a really hard play for anybody in politics without the intermediary mm -hmm. step of the media yep. actually informing people relentlessly, yep. as they should, mm -hmm. that climate change is already affecting America. Yeah almost everywhere, all day, every day. Yeah. Without that, that kind important. of like networking of knowledge, mm -hmm. nothing any politician is going to say is going to like stick because there's, yeah. there's no like webbing for it to for it kind to of stick to. Stick to. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So, um, you know, you can sort of, you know, and I did, I did take the messaging on I-1631 to task a little mm -hmm. bit after the election. Um, but fundamentally, I feel like the thing that we really need to do is to get the media to talk about climate change differently, yeah. and that will prime the pump for everything else. Everything else, everything exactly. else. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed uh, carbon tax is always brought up. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think you have mixed feelings. Am I right about that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a face. I'm like, Ugh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's something you know, out of um, even even like you know what I uh, proposed to be the righteous uh, politicians are always talking carbon right. tax, carbon tax, and 
I think you don't feel that this is the right route. I don't feel it's yeah. the right route. I think in maybe 1983, a carbon okay. tax would have been awesome. Yeah, it's not enough, right? It's, it's not like, enough. It's not At enough. this point, it would be a, a price on carbon would have to be a, over $400 a ton. Mm-hmm to get us to reduce our emissions at the speed that we need to reduce them. Yep. Um, that's not going to happen. Yeah. That's just not going to happen. Yep. So I feel like the climate movement is constantly spending its political capital on trying to get carbon taxes passed. Yeah. When even if they got passed, which seems like such a hard sell in America. Yeah, people don't like the word tax. They don't. This, yeah. Like the country was basically founded on the refusal to pay taxes, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is not something that's going to fly in America. Yeah, absolutely. And even if it did, it would start at like, what, $20 a ton? It's mm-hmm. just, it's, it's, it's pointless. It's pointless to spend political capital on something that's not going to work. Yeah. Furthermore, on a more sort of like conceptual level, I also think that the idea that you can pr- tweak the market to solve climate change mm-hmm. is so foolhardy yeah. because we are absolutely going to need government intervention mm-hmm. to turn this thing around. Yep. There is no way the fossil fuel industry is going to give up $10 t- trillion dollars in no assets. Way. No way. They're going to suck it dry if they can. Yeah. Of course, without yeah. – the power of the government standing mm-hmm. with the people and saying, no, we're going to do something differently because we're actually not going to let all these children die yeah. just so that we can continue to use fossil fuels. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, it, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, there's no price on carbon that's going to get us to where we need to get or fast enough. That's just, that's the. I mean, there yeah. is, but I don't know that it's going to pass. So yeah. let's stop fighting for this yep. and let's start fighting for the Green New Deal yeah. that restructures everything in a way that will improve everybody's lives and actually leave, you know, the planet generally habitable. Is there a way to talk about it in a way? I mean, can't there be um, an economic way to look at it that could make people money? I mean, because, I mean, if you're talking about climate change, renewable energy, just like, I don't know, I'm trying to talk about a narrative that's really positive as opposed to a carbon tax that people like to make money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are definitely entrepreneurial opportunities Mm -hmm. in the transition to safe energy. That goes without saying. But I think sort of the average person thinks about getting off fossil fuels and they're like, well, I don't have $30,000 to put solar panels on my roof or I don't have, you know, $33,000 to buy an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. It's too costly for me, you know. Um, I think that people still think that – Mitigating climate change is going to be more costly to them than climate change itself. And oh, there's yes. a, there's, yeah. there's an element of truth to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, that's, to me, the narrative that we need to change. It's not that, that climate change or mitigating climate change will help all of us um, make more money, but it will – we won't have to – pay for it out of our pockets in these direct ways. Mm. And it will raise our overall, our standard of living. It'll raise our public health. Mm -hmm. Um, It will bring down the cost of, you know, X, Y, and Z. So there's a way that like you can sort of, but in order to, to say that Mm -hmm. there has to be a government plan to make that true. And right now that there's There's just not. There's not. Yeah. What do you think about the idea of, um, kind of fighting for climate change as a human right. I know mm-hmm. in, um, I think it was 2010, the UN passed something about clean water being a right and, and uh, sanitation, was it, being a right? I yeah, mean, yeah, isn't, yeah. A, isn't a healthy climate a right? Is, 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 I, mean, I mean, wouldn't you think that that's like the think? basic human yeah, right? Well, yeah. that's the content of the lawsuit of the um, Juliana versus the United States government okay. lawsuit. So this is a really interesting thing. Um, yeah, there are these kids, essentially. Mm -hmm. Some of them are now in college. One or two may have already graduated from college, but they're kids. Uh, One of them is the the scientist James Hansen's granddaughter who sued the United States government in the Obama administration for abrogating their human right to a livable climate by promoting fossil fuels and fossil fuel development. Mm -hmm. Um, And this suit has been winding its way through the courts. And How's it going? Well, I'm not sure yes, because still the Supreme around, Court, that's, that's actually, yeah. the, the Trump administration requested a stay and the Supreme Court granted the stay, which mm-hmm. is kind of unprecedented, but then a week later said that the trial could proceed. Mm-hmm. 
Although they did give very pointed advice to a lawyer, lower court in Washington on how to get the suit dismissed. So I'm not 100 percent sure that they actually do want the trial to proceed. They might just sort of be obliquely instructing the lower court on how to dismiss the trial without <laughs> them having to take such an explicitly political stance. Yeah. We'll see. Yep. Um, but this is exactly the content of that, that, that case, yeah. that yeah. this is this is a human right that the United States government is depriving our children. No question. It's yeah. all around the world. It's, it's, it's something that I, I like that narrative because it's, I it like should it too. be. Absolutely. Um, I loved your article, Who is the We? And <laughs> we, we, are, uh, we are causing climate change because everyone is not equally complicit Absolutely here. Absolutely not. And, uh, you know, it, it, that I think you wrote the guilty collective. It invokes simply does not exist. Um, so 70% of global emissions come from 100 companies. Is that the case? That's true. And that, I is mean, un- that is unbelievable. I, I, I'm not so – I mean I don't, I don't really circulate that statistic so much because, mm-hmm. of course, those companies sell us product. Like, yes, those emissions originate in the products of those companies, but we yeah. are using those products. Yes. So um, – there is a way in which we are enmeshed in this fossil fuel economy and we don't necessarily have the choice to get off fossil fuels, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, to me, I feel like in the people that I feel like we need to focus on are the people who are collaborating with those companies mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to try to prevent us from transitioning away from fossil fuels. All the politicians who yeah. don't want actually to implement the plans that need to be implemented. Because they're in um, bed with the companies. Because yeah. they're in bed with the companies, yeah. you know. So, yes. So those 70 companies are um, uh, sociopathically genocidal. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> I like that pregnant pause before you drop that sociopathic genocide. I was, was going to put genocidal or sociopathic <laughs> No, first, yeah, you know, exactly. Either, either way works. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but then, of course, the politicians that are, you know, Supporting them are essentially collaborators. Yeah. So yeah. Um, those are the people that They're need enablers. to be target, yeah. targeted. You did um, in that article too. You also you know kind of talk about individuals too because mm-hmm. it's something. I mean, I think it's important that we also you know you want to feel like you're helping even if it's like totally. you know I know that's like we're talking about those hundred companies. Mm-hmm. That's a bigger thing. I think you know we we put use our vote for that and other other means. But right. at home, you know we. Definitely, there is some complicity, you write, of the 10% who produce 50% of global emissions every year by taking multiple long-haul flights uh, for pleasure travel, heating their homes instead of putting on a sweater and driving swollen SUVs <laughs> that they replace every four years. So, there, I mean, we could work on this as individuals oh, as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think there needs to be a massive culture shift mm-hmm. um, in which success is not conceived of as how many glamorous vacations you can take yeah. um, and the size of your house and how much you can consume conspicuously, yep. but is reconceived as, you know, how much love do you have in your life? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. what have you done to create safety and beauty yeah. for other people? Um, how long have you spent thinking today yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about yeah. something complex no, and love it. exciting? Yes. You know, there are so so Talk many things yeah. that make life worth living. Exactly, it's not the bigger the better. That's I mean, that's I mean, and once you things. realize that, like these things that you're doing are actually killing people, mm-hmm. it's like it. You know, it's it's really hard to get on a plane. Yeah. It feels bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's guilt. Once once you're what kind of woke to the ideas of what your, you know, repercussions of things you're doing, yeah, it feels guilty. So, you know, and it's tricky because, of course, much of the United States narrative has been about kind of success on this in this economic rubric. Yeah. Um, Capitalism's a hell of a drug. <laughs> it really is, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So there but, definitely has to be some retrenchment. Yeah, um, I saw that N- NBC article, which you, you uh, kind of things you could do at home, waste less food. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's something I think about my daughter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Maybe totally. For me, I'm always like making her too much, eat less factory farm meat, consume less energy and water. Uh, call and meet with your representatives and, and volunteer and, you know, dialogue and finding common ground. There's, I mean, I feel like so many people feel helpless and there are uh, Absolutely. there are things that we – you know, can do, hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah, on an individual level. Um, 
Well, we are still living in a democracy, after all. We are. <laughs> it's. I mean, sometimes you know, it feels like the the will of a minority is kind of masking the uh, the majority's needs and will. So. No, absolutely. I mean, it is an oligarchic, near liberal regime, but yeah. um, for now, at least, it's still a democracy. And one of the ideological. Um, programs of this neoliberal regime mm-hmm. is to make people think that the government is ineffective, mm-hmm. that people, you know, people's vote doesn't matter, yep. that um, social action and mass movements are naive mm-hmm. in some way, and that really the smartest move is to just be sort of a sophisticated cr- critic yeah. and not really someone who puts their heart on the line. Yep. Um, those are all lies. Yeah. If the government was so ineffective, then the fossil fuel industry wouldn't be spending so much, so money, much money on buying uh, politicians. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, That's proof I, positive right there. Exactly. So yep. we need to sort of, you know, retrench an idea of politics as – creating mass movements that that demand mm. that their democratically elected representatives yep. represent their interests, yeah. you know. And so these kids in the Sunrise Movement who occupied Nancy Pelosi's mm-hmm. office. Yeah, what did you think of that? It was so great. You loved it? Oh yes. God, I loved yep. it. I loved yep. it. I loved it. Exactly. You know? And then the way that Ocasio-Cortez yes. showed up and she's so beautiful what and did so they dynamic. Think? The people and, who were kind of like uh, uh, giving her a hard time about this, like what, who did they think was coming in? Like this is who she is. You know, I think that they don't realize that it's not going to be the same old yep, stuff absolutely. anymore. They, did they expect her to conform <laughs> into like who many of them are? Right? I can't when they wait till she's thirty-five. I want her to run for president. Oh, please! So badly. Sooner than later. <laughs> Sooner than later. No, exactly. that was really really cool to it was see. Amazing. And Nancy Pelosi was so excellent. She was like, I was so happy yeah, to see she? your action. Yeah, yeah. I hear what you're saying. She was like, you yes. Know? yes. She was like, yes. Yeah. This is what we're. This is we're going to be on the That's same hard, page. That's hard because I, 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 I'm one of them that kind of gets frustrated by the Democratic old guard and oh, so excited sure. about the, the, you know, the new, new people coming sure. in so it was nice to see that and yeah. I love what you just said about you know how they are trying to kind of um erode the trust of the government because I'm with you I believe yeah. that the government's going to be so crucial in in in, in dealing with this problem we Absolutely. just need the government that is you know working for the will of the people that's right how do we help end climate silence how do what I mean is this something you can volunteer to be a part of uh, oh. <laughs> but, 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 but um, you know I, I just it's, I think it's such an amazing cause you're part of and, and I'm sure some of the listeners would love to know what they can do to help well right now it's an all volunteer organization okay. um, I'm not taking any donations for mm-hmm. now. Um, if we grow and hire an intern then we'll start taking donations but for now there's no need to donate money Um The best thing that you can do is follow – honestly, it's like a digital activism platform. So the best thing you can do is follow endclimatesilence.org on Mm -hmm. Twitter Mm -hmm. and just retweet the heck out of their tweets because the more public eyes there are on these particular journalists, on these stories, the more that I feel these institutions will feel the pressure – That might make them change the culture of like, you know, segregating climate change into the science section and actually force all of the reporters on every desk to learn something about climate change and just feel a little more confident about linking the stories they're telling to climate change explicitly in just like one or two sentences. So the best thing to do is just retweet us, tweet at reporters. What is the Twitter? It's – if you type in end climate silence, That's Twitter will it right fill there. it. Yeah. That, and your personals? Um, oh, I'm Dr. Veeve. Dr. Veeve. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> awesome. So follow both of those. Um, really, I love the work you're doing. Thank I'm, you. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to spread the word about end climate silence. Thank you. It was so awesome to be here. Yeah. Thank you so much for asking me. Of course. Me. Of course. Um, thanks again. And thank everyone out there for taking another uh, trip with us uh, beyond the margin. This podcast is in the loop. The Legion of Osiris Podcasts. Osiris is creating a community that connects people like you with live experiences and podcasts about artists and topics you love. Get in the loop at OsirisPod.com. Cross the margin. Cross the margin. Cross the margin. Cross the margin.
Podcast.